So, is object-oriented programming bad? Let's have a look. So, object-oriented programming breaks code into separate blocks, known as classes. They are simply holders of functions and variables. Here's an example. So, we have some variables and we have a function. And the good, modularity. Let's say we want to test the speed of something. So, we want basically a timer. So, we want to do something and print the result of how long it took. We could do this manually, like this. So, we date time start. Day time end, elapsed time that, and then get the elapsed time in milliseconds and then print it. Of course, this is a bit cumbersome to do every time. Let's say we want to do this in 50 places. You have to copy the same code every time. So instead, let's create a class called timer. And we're just going to have this functionality here. And we're also going to hide most of it from us. So it just say start, stop. We don't need to know how it works. You just simply use it. And then we can change this to timer equals new, timer.start, timer stop, and then just write the result. This is a lot more modular. We don't need to understand how the timer works. We just use it and it's very modular. Also, it's less code. So it's very practical in this situation. Encapsulation. Let's say we have some bank accounts and we want to manage it. So we create a class called bank account and we create private fields at the top for the balance, the, uh, the account holder name and the pin. And then we'll create public, uh, public constructor and public functions. So the only way to interact with this is to use the functions. Let's say, for example, we want to do this. We create the account and then we just set the amount to 1 million. Well, we get an error here because this is private. You can't access it. So this is a way to kind of protect functionality and make sure that if you, you can't directly access the account or the balance, you should do that with deposits, not through directly accessing it. So it's a good way to control who accesses data and where from. Next, dependency injection. So dependency injection is where we send, we can we can send multiple multiple classes to a function with different results. So here we create an interface which has the log function. This basically means that any class that takes this interface needs to have a log function. Here we create console logger which inherits from our logger, and then we have log, which logs to the console. And then we have the file logger, which will log to a text file. And then simply we could just create both of them, and then we can run the test, and one will log to the console, one will log to the file. And it's interchangeable. You don't need to change the code. You just call log in the function. So this is very modular. It's very useful for that. So if you want to log to the console, you create the console logger. If you want to log to file, you create the file logger. You don't need to change the code. So let's look at situations where it can cause problems, in my opinion. So number one is nested classes. So say, for example, we want to manage some people in a company. And we create a class called employee. And inside of this, we create another class, an enum, another class, and another class. The problem with this is we need to actually open up the class to see what's inside it. We don't know what person is. Let's look. What's, what's person? Let's have a look. A person is a uh, string and a date of birth, and a date and a date is also another class. So we've got to look at that. A class, okay, a date is a enum with a month, int for the year, int for the day. So we've got a class inside a class inside a class, okay. Um, let's go back and, okay, what's a user type? So user type is an enum, junior, senior, administrator, okay. We've got the employee info, what's an employee info, what's this? We've got the ID number, the department, which is another enum, uh, the job role, the date. We've got another date. Um, this is just getting like a long list. <laughs> so this is lots and lots and lots of nesting. And the department is simply this. Um, then we go back to login details, which obviously this is an example. This is very bad. You shouldn't have the login details here and you shouldn't use a password in plain text. This is just an example. So how would you fix this? Well, simply you don't need to create this much nesting. You could just create simply name, date of birth, and you can use date time, which is a thing that already exists in C Sharp. Uh, ID number, just put them all in one class and you don't need to nest anything. Just nest if you need to, but if you don't, why it just overcomplicates things. And then we separate the password and the username and password into another section entirely because it shouldn't be here. So this is just a lot easier to read and a lot easier to maintain. But you might say, oh, no one actually codes like this, do they? Well, have you heard of a language called C++? Let's say, for example, we want to create a timer, like in the first example in C Sharp. So in C++, you do it like this. Um, here we're using auto. 
but I would argue you're not getting the full C++ experience if you use auto. Let's not use auto. And we get this spaghetti code. SED chrono system clock time point now equals SED chrono system clock now. SED chrono system clock time point duration duration equals now dot time time since epoch. Long long da da da. SED chrono duration cast SED chrono milliseconds duration dot count. So what does all this mean? Well, that's a good question. Let's have a look at system clock, shall we? So first we have a load of redefinitions. We're using rep, which is a long, long. I don't know why you can't just write long, long. You've got to use rep. The period is a ratio, which stands for 100 nanoseconds. And you have the duration, which is, and we have a, a, a macro here, which stands for SDD chrono. So it's not repeating SDD chrono. Duration, rep, period. So it's basically creating a duration that's a long, long, uh, with a ratio of 100 nanoseconds. Then we have a time point, which is a redefinition of a time point system clock. But isn't this a system clock? So how is this? Isn't this referring to itself? I don't really understand what's happening. And we go to time point here, which is also a it's a templated class. And that has a load of redefinitions. And that has a duration in it. So when we get the duration, we're getting the duration from the time point, which is what? Also, it doesn't even have something like this, because you could simply just get rid of all this nonsense, or you could keep the nonsense, just simply in Chrono, in STD Chrono, have get time in milliseconds since 1970, and just put and just hide this from the user. Why does the user need to understand your nested class mayhem just to get a time stamp? Let's look at how Zig does this. In mean, Zig, you simply just say equals STD dot time millistamp. That's it. To compare these, how to get a timestamp in milliseconds. In C++, we create a templated class called time point system clock inside another class inside a template inside STD. We make it we make it time point for short. Then we get another class duration that is nested inside time point. Finally, we need to convert the duration into milliseconds, so we call duration cast with the duration. This returns another templated class called uh, toe, I don't know. Then we finally call count on this class to get another templated class called rep, which zig just call a function inside std time what are you doing all this for so this is an example of over engineering yes this is powerful in c++ but it's also ridiculously complicated and hard to use example two nested inheritance so here we have two classes for different file types jpeg and png and they basically have two identical functions inside them and a name and they have unique code underneath let's say we don't want to repeat ourselves what we can instead do is create a class called image and put those properties on it. Then we could simply just extend JPEG with image and PNG with image, and you don't need to repeat yourself. And then in here, we can simply just say JPEG, JPEG, download and print, and we can call both of them. Now, this is a good example of inheritance used well, but when you nest it a lot, you get into lots of problems. Let's say, for example, we want to create a game that's an RPG, and we want to manage some data of some characters in the game. So we create a class called character, it has name, total health, speed, game object for movement, playable or not, lots of things and some functions. And then we create something like fighter. So we don't want we don't want every character to fight, we want some characters to fight. So we're going to create a fighter, we're going to extend it from character. And this will have a weapon, set weapon damage, and the level. And then from fighter we're going to extend the player because we want to have things like add experience, level up, increase the stats, which doesn't also really apply to every character. And then maybe we extend from fighter again with enemy, with the faction, the hostile, if they're hostile to which faction, uh, are they hostile to the player, are they a boss? Then we have a knight, which also extends from enemy, we have lots of attacks, and maybe we have a demon with different attacks, and a goblin with other attacks. And then maybe we want to extend the character class even more with a NPC who just has dialogue. And then maybe we want to extend from NPC a trader. And then so we have basically a class that extends to an NPC that extends to a trader. And then we have a fighter which extends to a player, which extends to an enemy, which extends to a knight. Why are we doing this again? It's a really good question. In this situation, it gets almost too complicated to manage. You should simply separate them and not do this. I generally haven't found a good situation where you can use this much inheritance, but there can be some examples where it can be used. So one example of good nested inheritance is actually in Unity. Uh, in Unity, on every game object that you actually attach to an object, we have this thing called mono behavior, which kind of hides functionality from the user. 
so if I go to mono behavior, our mono behavior also inherits from behavior, and this inherits from components, and this inherits from object, from the objects of the base class. Uh, well, I don't really under need to understand all the mechanics of how game objects work. So in Unity, it's kind of complicated how this stuff works. But you don't really need to understand it. You can just simply just put mono behavior as, a, as an extension and then just write your own code. It doesn't really matter too much. So that's a good example of nested inheritance. Okay, so inheritance, so the good stops you repeating code, can hide complexity from other developers. Uh, bad creates coupling. If you change the base class, then you need to change all the inherited classes too. It's hard to refactor and it overcomplicates things. So use inheritance where it makes sense. Sometimes it's easier just to repeat yourself. So in summary, is OOP bad? Uh, OOP is a tool and all tools can be used well or they can be used badly. I think if we uh, do things like nested classes and nested inheritance, it's generally bad and hard to maintain. But having things like modular classes generally help and are very useful. So it just depends how you use it. Let me know your thoughts.